you guys sent questions in, and they were very good questions, and some were really kind of deep, and some were, but they were all very sincere, and uh, so uh, we, uh, we started this the, the first Sunday in, in January for uh, the new year, and uh, I wasn't able to be here. I was sick. I had COVID. I had all of that stuff, and we still had some leftover questions, so we said, hey, let's, uh, let's do part two. And so today is part two. We're going to take some questions that we didn't get to the first time. All right. There's no rhyme or reason to this. Uh, so we'll just, we'll just head it off. Okay. All okay. Right. Jamie's in charge. Jamie's in charge. Jamie, watch charge. out. I'm in charge. All right. So, hey, I've set a timer for 40 minutes, and we're at 39, 24, 23, 22, <laughs> 21. So um, just so y'all know, okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Let's do this thing. All right, so I am Jamie. I'm a recovery pastor here at Aaron Lakes, man. And uh, to say that I'm out of my element is an understatement next to these three guys um, with all their doctorates and all that. Um, I don't have one of those, Jamie. We're, well, you're we're working good. on no. it. But you know, the, the saying, if you want to look uh, tall, hang around short people, it don't go what are you well with this. If you want to look smart, hang around yeah. unsmart smart people. We should have a question. Of, here. We should have a question up there that says who has the best hair of everybody here. Well, we already know that. Thank, we, you, we, thank, that, you, that thank know. you. Who has hair? You know. <laughs> Last time we were up here, we had couches. Now they put us in these chairs. That's they look okay in these chairs. I look like a can of busted biscuits in this chair. All right. I do not like this. All okay. Right. All right. All right. Uh, question one is is there a biblical viewpoint regarding cremation who wants to do that you want to go for you well, weren't here last time i wasn't here last time jeff uh, gets to answer them all all of them there, there's there's some good reasons for cre cremation there's some reasons not to do it the, the bible doesn't address it one way or another i will say this uh did you know that all, uh, at least 40 percent of americans now are being cremated and one of the reasons is because it cost uh, you know, that kind of thing. 90% uh, of China is cremated. Uh, they have no land. And so that, that, that's a very practical reason for that. The Bible says, you know, from dust we came, from dust we return. So bottom line is your body, whether you put it in, you know, you put it in a you know, $10,000, $20,000 casket, I got news for you, your body is going to decay. I, anyway. I agree. I, I'm with you on that. But I, I do want to point out, uh, one of my seminary professors told me one time that the only time, that this is just food for thought, okay? I, I agree with everything he just said. But one of the things that you see all throughout Scripture is, is, is more traditional burials. The only instance in which you see cremation happen is um, typically through the pagan uh, worshipers. And so just to keep in mind, Abraham had a burial site. He purchased for him and his wife. Uh, the Lord provided a burial for Moses. Uh, the, the same practice continued through the New Testament, and so we see all that. So, um, so again, I, I don't see anything biblically wrong with cremation, but I just, I just like to make that note uh, that, that you do see it in Scripture. I, I tend to lean with more Scripture, so I see burial well, more I than think, anything. Well, I think the other side of it is that they, most Old Testament and New Testament believers had the mind that the, you know, God was going to bring back the soul and the, and the body, you know. But it, if God can't recreate us, the one who created us in the first place, then, you know, then we've got a, a, a small God. My, 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 uh, my, <laughs> but I think that was why they did yeah, it that my, way. My thought on this was, is, is like, or if you, my joke, this is a joke, all right, I just want to frame this, is that, <laughs> you know, if you, if you did get cremated, and this is what we, this is what you joke about in theology classes, I guess, but are we going to just be up in heaven in a pile of ashes with our little eyes floating around? Like, is that what we're going to be if we're cremated? <laughs> Um, that's just where my mind goes. It's a horrible joke. It's a terrible joke. Um, so uh, let's move on. Well, at the bottom line in this church, if you if there's an urn up there or there's a casket up there, we're we're still gonna we're still gonna celebrate your death if you're a Christian. All right. So don't worry. Well, about and I it. think you've got to remember too. I mean, if if God cannot take the body and recreate it, then what about those who are drowned at sea, those who are burned in a house, whatever? And so. Whatever we do with our earthly body is not going to matter. When we get to heaven, we get a, a new body, a glorified body. We see that in, Re uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. So I don't think it's an issue. I think there's not a biblical stance one way or the other, but in the end, it's going to all work out in heaven. As an old preacher that was looking at the, the, the casket Lord. and the body in the casket, and he said, listen, folks, this is, this is just a shell. It's kind of like a peanut. It, it's, it's, not, it's not what's inside. And so when we look at our brother, the nut's gone home. 
That's why I just had a weird look on my face. I knew you were going somewhere. Let's on. All right. Moving on. Jamie, keep us flowing, brother. <laughs> Moving on. So uh, next question. Genesis 2.23 says, and the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. Is Adam, and then the question is, is Adam comparing Eve with another woman? Um, I, I believe the key phrase here, I, I would say no. Um, first of all, no. Woman has not been created yet in, in, this, in this scenario. This is, um, the, this is that happening. All right. So the, the short answer to say is Adam comparing Eve with another woman. No. Um, but I, I, I think the key phrase here is this one at last, which would make it seem like it's comparing Eve to another woman, even though it's not. So the issue, again, woman not created. Um, Adam at this point had wild animals uh, and all that. No companions, only animals here. So this is the creation of woman um, from the rib of Adam and, and, and off we go. Well, he's comparing them to all the animals had a mate, but he didn't have a mate. Yeah. That's what the that's what the text. Is. Yeah, not not comparison to another woman. Right. Yeah, if you look at the context, at right. last this one is mine. Right. right that, for, that's right, the yeah, right. yeah for me. Right. Well, if you look at the context, God had already tasked Adam with naming the animals. So here's Adam. He's seeing you know male monkey, female monkey having fun. He's seeing giraffes wrapping their necks around each other, and he's looking around. He said, I ain't got none of that. <laughs> ain't, ain't none of that for me. And finally he sees a woman, he goes, at last! I just There's said that. one for me. But they laughed better when you I did will. it. Y'all are deep theologically. I'm just cornbread and creek water, man. Yeah. All right. Need some <laughs> cornbread. Yeah, can we get some cornbread, please? Anyway. All right. Y'all done? Yes. All right. <laughs> yes, we're done. I don't think they're done, but we're, go ahead. <laughs> you said cornbread. You wanted cornbread. I, you know. Anyway. Genesis 3.14 says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild an animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. Why would, so the question, why would God tell the serpent he would crawl on his belly if he already was? It sounds like the original serpent may have uh, walked upright. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, and so here's here's where I'm going to go. I believe a physical change happened in the serpent, and I would say that he did walk upright. Um, but it, it it would be that this the beast of the field that's used in that text that normally is a reference to a something that could the beast of the field walking upright would have legs. So to say that it didn't have legs originally would also mean because again think of what's happening here. This is the curse. So there's something taking place. So there had to be a physical change that would have happened. And so when, when he says you're going to crawl on your belly for all the days of your life, then we're assuming here as we look at this and other scholars have said the same thing, that, that there was a change that happened. If, if there wasn't a physical change that happened as a result of the curse and the fall, then that would make everything that we believe as, as believers um, that, 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 that it's just more metaphorical, which isn't the case. We know that there was a literal curse that we are living in that today, and uh, and so that's that's what I would say there. Good answer. Well, I'm, and I think I think the last part is the most important because if it was not a curse, if nothing really happened, then it then nothing happened. So yeah, Jewish interpreters I think a lot of times think that maybe the serpent walked on two, yeah. and now he's on Martin whatever, Luther. So. I put in my notes right here. It said um, he he said this, and I agree with this. He said from this, some observe, uh, some obvious conclusions follow that before sin, the serpent was a most beautiful little animal and pleasing to man, as little mules, sheep, and puppies today. Moreover, little puppies. that it walked up right. Yeah, that's Martin Luther. That's Martin Luther. So. Well, we we know you know Satan left heaven's gl heaven's glory. Uh, he was the actually. Uh, and Danny's practicing for the other service. I'm not, I'm not making much of this, but Satan was the music leader <laughs> in heaven. But anyway, uh, Lord have mercy. You know, so he was he was the most beautiful angel. Uh, so when you when you think about angelic beings, every angelic being that we know of in the Bible came in in kind of a you know two legged form or whatever. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm good. Good. Just, I think the key is that this is all speculation. We don't have a clue. Well, no right. clue. Right. And so, 
you know, Take it you're not going to answer is. Bible Jeopardy with that because it's, it's all speculation because nobody knows it doesn't say. When we get to heaven, when we talk about those kind of things like that, we just, there's so much speculation there. I mean, it just, it is what it is. I mean, we can talk about it. We can think about it, but we don't know. So, all right. Well, there you go. You've not answered one yet. You should take this I one. I talked too much last time is what I was told. So. I didn't say that. <laughs> this one's for Chris. Oh, great. <laughs> is Israel God's chosen people, and how do the people in Israel believe, and do the people in Israel believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think clearly the Bible states that Israel is God's chosen people, um, and which is a very huge issue today with what's going on in the Middle East. Um, but I think it's clear. You see throughout Scripture that God has referred to the nation of Israel as His people. Uh, he calls them their, His special treasure. He calls them His son. He calls them His inheritance. I mean, all through the Old Testament, you see God's unique relationship. Uh, and it goes all the way back to when Abram, God gave Abram the promise in Genesis 12, through you I will make a people. Uh, and through this people I'll bless the world. That's obviously his chosen people. Even Paul refers to it in, in the book of Romans that the nation of Israel. Now, the problem is part two of the question, do the people in Israel believe Jesus is the Messiah? And the answer is yes and no. Some do and some don't. Uh, there's a group today, what we call the Messianic Jews, which are Jews who hold very much to Jewish tradition, but who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But unfortunately, most of the Jewish culture today does not believe. Um, and, and we see this in Romans where God even says to Paul, and Paul says, and says, listen, I'm going to take what's yours and I'm going to give it to the Gentile. And I'm going to use what the Gentiles have to make you jealous so that one day you will come back. And I think there's great hope for that. But in, in short, the answer is yes, Israel, the nation of Israel is still God's chosen people, even though they reject him. But one day, the Bible says, God's going to do a great work and call them back to himself. I think we have to understand that. And I think that's the key part is, is that God is going to redeem his chosen people and Israel are his chosen people. And so we're just, we're just thankful that he lets us come along for the ride. Always remember that every promise of Jesus is not just spiritually true. It will be physically true. Right. There's coming a time when he will be king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, the bottom line is he's not right now. Satan is the god of this world, the Bible says. But when God promised Israel is his chosen, he means it. God has always had a special place in his heart for Israel. Israel's uh, away from God. I've been to the Holy Land four times. And it is amazing uh, when you talk to shop owners, uh, you know, that are Jewish, it is amazing how close they are uh, to, uh, to believing that Jesus is Messiah, especially through the book of Isaiah. You can't deny it, but their minds are darkened right now. Uh, and so the whole book of Revelation, after chapter four in the book of Revelation, everything pretty much changes on earth to a Jewish prophecy, bringing God's people back like he promised in the beginning. So yes, uh, God, Israel is still God's chosen, uh, but they don't believe as Jesus is Messiah. And it's very heartbreaking when you realize they have the same book of Isaiah, they have the same book of Ezekiel that we do, and yet they, they just don't see it. And, but many do, but, but they don't. It's a good reminder to continue to pray for Israel. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And in the Bible, it tells us they are God's pray people. for the peace yeah. of Jerusalem, and we should be. And I'm telling you what's going on in America with people standing up for Palestine and Hamas and all that is absolutely heartbreaking, and it shows how far from God we are becoming in this nation. I'm good with that. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm good with that. That's, that's, now that's borderline on answering questions and getting to preaching. He, he and started that, preaching. Right? Yeah, if he starts doing that, we'll just, calm him down. Yeah, Amen. Right. Easy killer. Easy. Uh, <laughs> next question. Uh, it seems as if the four accounts of the resurrection conflict with each other, how can they all be true? Well, I say Jamie answers this one. Go for it, brother. Well, <laughs> no, just putting on what do you think, Jamie? Just, <laughs> well, I'm no theologian. Jamie's like, I'm the, near, I'm the moderator. <laughs> but I, I believe that, uh, you know, there was uh, four, four guys that wrote the New Testament. Each one of them had yeah. not a different view, but a different focus. focus on what God was telling them as they wrote it out. So 
I don't believe there, I don't believe any scripture con, uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Contradicts, Contradicts yeah. Yeah. Uh, one another. I think they all go hand yeah. in hand. So. I was I was going to say when when thinking about this this question, um, one of the one one of the popular claims that I found, and I think what Jamie said is accurate because I've uh, that's what I have here kind of in, in my notes about this is that I read each, your notes. Each one's different from a perspective. So Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, and then Mark, which we're going to be studying, pro portrays him as the suffering Son of God, who is the sacrifice for sin. Who is Jesus is pretty much a majority of what Mark is talking about. Luke sees Jesus as the Savior, and uh, John focuses on Jesus as the eternal Son of God and self-revelation of God the Father. So, but one of the things that people like to point out, particularly when it comes to these, these views, is, um, is, is, the, is the empty tomb. You know who who saw the empty tomb, but again, I think we have to to remember that that all the stories actually complement each other. They're not when you read it. It's just like when we read Revelation. When we studied Revelation, we said that to read Revelation just straight through and think all oh, that's happening in order. That's not exactly what's happening there. Everything's a cycle. It's kind of like a funnel and a tornado that's spinning and spinning. Well, I think you approach the Gospels the same way. In the Gospels, what you have is is you have four different accounts four different focuses that when you compile them together, now you're, you're looking at the bigger picture. So it's not that they conflict each other, they actually complement each other. How's that? That's good. Well, I think it's, it's, There's it's more to it. But. It's like watching a basketball game. If I, if you and I are watching the Carolina Duke game, which is coming up in a couple of days, Next week. Right? Next if week. we're watching the same game, you're going to say he think, missed the foul. I'm going to say he got the I foul. I think We're for the sake of the our relationship, foul. we don't need to watch that together. <laughs> That's probably true. But I think <laughs> you see the same event, and, and sometimes we focus on one thing. So one of the great debates in the resurrection is how many women were there. That, yeah, right. So there's two women about. in one. There's one woman in the other. Well, to say that there's two women means that there was at least one woman. Mm -hmm. So when one says, hey, there was this woman, it doesn't mean that there wasn't another woman, it's just that that's what they're emphasizing. And I think a, a great example of this is we are a little hypercritical when we read stuff because we read it from a very American perspective and we say, well, if there's two people there, then say two. Well, to say there's two means there's, there's at least what? There's at least one. Yeah. You know, and so we, we have to remember the, the writer's emphasizing whatever his point of view is, but it's not to say that there was an, saw another person there. Um, who, who saw the empty tomb first? Were there two angels or was there one angel? I mean, it's, all that gets into like, well, this one says there's two, but that one says there's one. Well, two means there's there at least one. There just may have been one that they didn't mention. Like yesterday, I was with one of my kids. I was also with the other ones too, but I was with one of them. That doesn't mean the others weren't there. It just means I'm emphasizing the one versus the others. So I think when you look at it and compliment, you look at a harmony of the Gospels, I think the essential storyline is essential is, is there in all four counts. Nothing disputes the actual evidence of the resurrection, even though two women here, one woman there, two angels here, one angel. I, I think that's just, I don't think that's contradiction. Right. Uh, did I tell you I've been to Holy Land four times? I've heard that. I heard that. Uh, <laughs> when you go to the Holy Land, there are two places that you go to that they say is the empty tomb. Well, it can't be two, but there's one that has a church built over it. It doesn't look like what you think. And then there's another one called the garden tomb. And you go to the garden tomb, and it's in a beautiful setting. There was a stone. Obviously, there was a stone there that was rolled away, the whole thing. You usually had the Lord's Supper there and all that. I wish I could take you all back. Ain't nobody going over there right now. But here's my point. Both of them still empty. Yeah. All right? That's the point. The point is not how many women were there or not there who was there. The point is the tomb is empty. Right. He's risen just as he said. Amen? Preach. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. No, that's it. That's okay. It. That's, it. <laughs> that, that's, that's coming in March. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Andrew, that was the, their, their answer was a whole lot better than what we had. So moving on, what are some? I of the felt Bible like Chris said the same thing I did, I did just with more that. academic swag. Well, That's all. With that three doctor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are some Bible verses that are practical ways I can deal with my depression? Mm. Yeah, that's Question. good. That's Why don't good we good all point. hit that one a little bit? Yeah. You want to go first? Well, uh, first of all, I don't. I don't know if y'all have noticed yet or not, and I've, I've kind of pointed this out to several people. Andrew 
has a giftedness that I don't have, especially in the area of counseling. Uh, he is much more gifted. I'm just an, I'm just a, a gospel preacher. Cornbread and creek water. I'm cornbread yep. and creek water. And my philosophy Still waiting is, on that cornbread. My philosophy is, you ain't gonna listen to God. Why are you gonna listen to me? But Andrew goes deeper than that. He care. I'll be honest with you guys. Andrew cares for you and your family. Not that I don't, but he cares in a different way. So uh, he is he is very good to to answer some of this. But I will just say this: be careful. Be very careful that you live your life on your feelings. Yeah. Your feelings are very, very fickle. That's a good word. There are times that I feel like I'm close to God, and there are times that I think God's on the other side of Mars somewhere. Mm. But it doesn't change anything. I have what I have in Christ, not because I feel it, but because God said it. That's so good word. always nail that down. You yeah. are who God says you are and not how you feel you are. I've got a pretty pretty extensive thing that I'll break down because um, the answer is kind of uh, Bible verses and then practical ways. And, uh, and if you ask this question, I'll be more than happy to send it to you, and it can be between, be, between me and you and, and, and Jesus, all right? So first of all, the Scriptures, I would say the Psalms. Uh, you have several Psalms that uh, were actually King David and others, the, the, the other writers of the Psalms, are walking through depressed times crying out to God, asking God, where are you? Um, you know, so the Psalms are really good and really are good to identify with. Um, I think we referenced that little book, Pray in the Bible. That was, uh, that book actually, Praying the Bible, walks through how do you pray scripture, and it primarily walks through how to pray through the Psalms. Um, excellent resource, so I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, reading through over and over, Psalms 130 is the one that comes to my mind off the top of my head. Um, focus on scripture about hope. Hope, the hope we have. That's what, that's what you were talking about, really. We, we have what we have because of our hope in Jesus. So that could be 1 Peter 5.10. That could be Ephesians 1.8. That could be Hebrews 10.23. Um, and then also scriptures that focus on joy. Um, and, and just about every Bible co- uh, has a concordance in the back of it that may, it may or may not. If yours doesn't, then that's okay. But you can, you can Google this. What are scriptures that focus on joy, suffering, hope? And just, and just find some verses. Um, but, but let's talk a little bit about strategies. I got, I got a couple of them here. First of all, determine whether the depression is circumstantial. So in other words, is there something linked to that that you know of? Death of a family member or a loss of a loved one or some, something along that regard. Or is it chemically caused? Because that's a, that's a real thing. I mean, I tell people that all the time. And, uh, and in fact, the testimony that we had at Recovery Alive last Monday was um, the, the, one of the things, I, and I amended it from the back of the room because I can't amen this enough. He said, don't think that just because you're a believer in Christ doesn't mean that you d- can't take depression medication. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with that. And it's like Jamie said a couple of weeks ago, we still take blood pressure medication. You know, we, we do all these things. And so there, there's, sometimes there's a, there's a, a clinical issue to things. Um, instead of focusing on your depression and the difficulties that come with it, um, try uh, uh, focus on God, who is in complete control of everything, because it's easy for us to focus on our circumstances and our situation. Um, other than ask yourself this question: Who am I going to trust during this time? What will I choose to worship? If, if you choose to trust or worship yourself or even people, that's not going to get you very far. But if we constantly are reminding ourselves to trust in God, to surrender to Him, to give to Him, we understand there's a greater purpose through our suffering. It's just like what, um, what James says. You know, uh, he says that our, our, our trials are for, to, to make us complete. You know, that's why he says to, to find joy in the midst of trials. Um, I got several others here. Um, add or structure a routine to your life. Um, Sometimes that can be a root cause of of dwelling on things, but the more structured we are, the more uh, repetitive we are and have routines in our life, that can help. Um, And start trying to work on renewing your mind. Um, Change the way you're thinking. Um, Instead of trying to dwell on these things, find other things, uh, positive things in Scripture, uh, what Scripture says. And then uh, lastly, um, keep the phrase, that doesn't work out of your vocabulary. Keep the phrase, that doesn't work out of your vocabulary, because again, it's all about renewing our mind, transforming our mind. If we keep telling ourselves one thing, um, we're going we're gonna to believe it. You know, it's just like when we keep hearing the lies of Satan, we keep hearing these things over and over and over again. 
uh, we, we tend to buy into those things, but we have to replace that with, uh, with, with truth. So um, I got several others here, but for the sake of time, I'll stop right there. There's a lot. There. Well, I think it's a good reminder, too, that there were huge heroes of the Bible who struggled with depression. Yep. And sometimes we think, well, if I'm depressed, then I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not saved or whatever. Elijah, after the great battle, yeah. Suffered with depression and went over in the corner under the tree and was like, "All right, take me out, Lord. I'm, you know, I'm done." The Apostle Paul, after some of his greatest ministry, uh, writes in Second Corinthians one four through eleven, "You know, blessed, you know, God who comforts us, so we might comfort this and blah blah blah." And then he says, "We were at the point of despair, even despair of our own lives." And here's a guy who's at the end of the rope, at the end of the string, at the end of his rope. One of the greatest men who's been used by God of all time, and yet they struggled. And so I think it's just sometimes we just need to remember that that depression's real. I mean, there's a huge number of Americans that struggle with it, and it's okay. You can't stay there, uh, but you just remember. Even David dealt with it. David, uh, if we if David is actually who wrote Psalm 42 and 43, there's a whole psalm there of him saying, "Hey, you know, why why am I so downcast?" And then over and over again, and then he goes back and let me hope in the Lord. And so I think that's a great reminder, just that you're not alone. Uh, some 16 to 20 percent of Americans struggle with depression, so you're not you're not a lone ranger out there. Amen. You know the Bible. Uh, we talk a lot about give your heart to Jesus. How's your heart? Uh, you know all of that, and that's and that's true. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible talks much much more about the mind than it does the heart. And uh, you know Paul tells us whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are noble. Whatsoever things are excellent, think on these things. So you're right. What, what about you, Jamie? Anything you'd add to that just from a... Yeah, so being someone that does struggle with depression has, has for a long, long time, um, it is real. Um, you know, sometimes I say, man, I, I got depressed. I get depressed because my beer quits growing or I didn't get that motor, new motorcycle. That's just being a baby. That's not being depressed. <laughs> Um, I'm still, if that's the case, I'm in trouble. You're just a baby. And he's really in trouble. <laughs> really in trouble. But, you know, but depression, real depression, when you find yourself where you can't get out of your bed or you don't feel like getting out of the house and you isolate, that's real. That's not being a baby. I don't care what anybody says. That, that's real. And that's something that's a chemical imbalance, I think. Um, and that's when you do need that. That's when I need my medicine. Um, I, sometimes I think, okay, well, I'm good. I don't need to take it no more. And then my wife reminds me real quickly that you need to get back on that medicine um, because it helps. Um, ways that I felt, felt to, uh, to deal with it is um, one is to be, be open, be honest uh, with your spouse, with your friend, with uh, someone that you can trust, someone you can open up to um, so you don't just hold it in and, um, you know, of course, read your Bible and pray, and all those things, the spiritual things, are definitely good uh, and most important. But yeah, depression is real. I, I think you can come to recovery alive. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean that as a plug. No, you I mean, surround yourself here, with people. If you try to do the Lone Ranger Christianity, you're going to you're going to struggle. And this is a huge issue. And I think a lot of people, it's a cycle. Depression begets more depression. And if you're isolated and have nobody in your life, I mean. Paul even says in 2 Corinthians, hey, we want to do that so that others might pray with you. And so I think Recovery Alive, that's, that would be a great place to go as a very practical way to yeah. Yeah, get started. I, I, surrounding yourself with people is, is, is key. People that are not going to bring you down, but people that are going to help lift you up. And, that's, and there's a, a, a key phrase there to keep in mind. The other thing that I would say too, just um, I, no, not many people know this. I think I told our students this one time, but whenever I was in uh, middle school and high school, I struggled with depression. And for a while, actually, I had to go on um, some depression medication for about six months or a year. But there, but once I got through that that season, I actually haven't been on it since. So, so there is a a sense of I think timing where you know it may be that you do need to get some clinical help and 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 have something to help you get through that. Um, in some cases, it may be that you know you're on that for the rest of your life, and there's not there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, but there may be some cases where it's just a season, and then you you uh, you come out of that uh, valley. So anyway, it's good. Stuff got. I think we're good. We're going. We're going. Hold on a second. Let me see. 1035. Yeah, I know, but we're at 1041, 40, 39, 38, 37. 
So the next question, what does the Bible say about when we all get to heaven? Will you and your spouse still be married? <laughs> well, some of us in this room say, I hope so. Some in this room say, Lord, please, no. I was just going to uh, say, uh, and oh, I'm not gonna what say a who's day that. of rejoicing that will yeah. be. Okay. No, uh, you weren't going to do it. I was going to do it. I'm not getting in trouble. Marriage on this earth is the closest relationship that we have to the relationship God wants us to have with him. That's why we have the book of Solomon. Uh, you know, so married love, good married love, solid Christian married love really is the closest relationship you can have. Uh, when we get to heaven, I, I, I believe that we will have such, we will not only, we won't be, I don't, I don't think we'll be married. And let me tell you why, I don't think we'll need to because I will love my wife and I will love you and I will love each other more than I've ever loved in my life. So I don't think we need that marriage and giving in marriage. I think that I think marriage on earth is just an illustration of how much God loves us. Uh, anyway. No, I think that's good. I'm glad you said that so people didn't get mad at me when I said that I didn't think that we were going to be married. Um, I do think, though, there's something to be said about us still knowing each other, though. Um, you know, and it, that may that may be that we, you know, maybe we remember parts of that or being married. I, I don't know what that looks like, but I mean, you think of the transfiguration. Um, they knew each other. I mean, they visibly knew each other in that in that moment. So I think that's one way to look at it. Um, I don't think when we get to heaven. Uh, how many of y'all seen the movie Men in Black? Anybody? Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad y'all know what that movie is. Um, but they have that little mind wiper thing in there. And I think some people view heaven that way. And so what they do is that when they want to wipe somebody's memory, you, you look at this little thing and it goes click. And then, and then their whole memory is erased. And then they just restart where they were before. But I don't think that's going to be the case when we get to heaven. Again, this is a speculation thing, but I think the transfiguration kind of says it all. Um, they knew what they looked like. Um, families and friends, I think, will recognize them. I also believe... Um, you know, uh, you know, we're going to give an account of our life of how we lived it on earth. And if that's the case, then I would assume there's going to be some, there's got to be some memory of, of what's happened there, or at least being told about it. So whether that's God saying, Hey, this is what happened or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know. There's speculation there, but, um, but I, I think we're, we're not going to be in family. And again, for example, um, Brittany and I, I don't think we'll be married in heaven, uh, but we're going to be with the family of God. And that's, that's so critical to remember and I think that if I could just say anything here and I'll, I'll stop is, is it's all about Jesus where, where we are in, we're unified with him in heaven. And I think a lot of times church, we tend to make heaven about us, that it's about us again, we're along for the ride and praise God. He allows us that opportunity through a relationship with him to be with him. But I'm just saying I ain't worried about anything in heaven except for being able to be with my Savior and not having to worry about anything else we're going through down here. So, well, so a couple of things I would add, I think just add, add to what you've said. Number one, the question is what does the Bible say? Well, here's what Jesus says, Matthew 22, 30, at the resurrection people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. It's that simple. But I think what the struggle is, because we hear that and we go, this is, this is my best closest I, I relationship. I can imagine not being with my wife. You know, exactly. Yeah. But I think what we have to remember is that, that that's, that's an earthly thing and that's great. And we, but, but when we go to heaven, there's a relationship that's bigger than that. And I think here we cannot fathom that. So when we read passages like where Jesus says, this, who is my mother and brother, right? You know, like this, the, you need to go hate your mother and brother compared to the love that you have for me. We struggle with that because we can't imagine anybody hating anybody. You know, in that I, I can't hate my mother, can't hate my father, or my brother and sisters. But he's, he's not saying hate them. He's saying, but in comparison to how much you love me, it looks like that. And I think in our, in our culture today, we've lifted marriage up to be the ultimate. And it is. Yeah. I love my wife. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, 100,000 times. And if yep. she was in the room, I would probably add even more zeros to that. But, but you, you know what I mean? But when we get to heaven, it's, it's, it's another level. It, yeah, that's <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? And so I think that's the struggle is we hear that and we go, well, what do you mean that I wouldn't be married in heaven? It's, it's not about that there. And, and not to lessen it, I think you're still going to have a special relationship with your, your spouse. But I think when you get to heaven, it's going to be much more about 
the glory of being in the kingdom yeah. and being being who God has created us to be, which in perspective is nothing like compared we're back to, what we to the, about. we're back to Genesis, right? We're yeah. back to that unison, that that just being with God and enjoying that, and and that doesn't lessen marriage, it in but it, it heightens the glory of God. If, if your view of heaven is we're going to be, we're just not going to be anything. Uh, we're, you know, we're just going to be up there. We're just, we're just spirits floating around. Uh, in, in the book of Revelation, it, it, it talks so much about the reunion of heaven and about relationships in heaven. Uh, and, and that's something we got, we got to keep in mind. When I first started out preaching and I, and I would preach a funeral my messages were all about heaven being a real place. Streets of gold, gates of pearl, all of that. And it is. It is a real place. But now as I grow older and I'm getting closer to that place, my emphasis now, my heart now, is on the fellowship of heaven, the relationships that are in heaven. And that's what we got to keep our hearts and minds on. Heaven is a real place. But it is a place of tremendous worship and fellowship and joy, all, all, of, the, all of those things. That was good. That was, that was really good. That was good. Are you serious? Yeah, I want you to send me that later so I can. Okay, yeah, I got you. <laughs> it's uh, true. How many older people can identify with me on that? Amen? You, uh, you, change, you change your view of heaven as you get older. You really do. Because we ain't that far. All right, so, so we're down to um, 4, 23, 22, yeah. 21. Um, this, is, this is a pretty, pretty loaded question, so I guess since y'all put it up there, we'll say this is the last one, and then we'll, we'll try to be as uh, concise as we can. So go ahead, Jamie. We'll, we'll go ahead and answer this. All right, so last question. How will you know who is in heaven even if you've never met? For instance, we lost the baby. How will we know him or her and be able to find them? It's a great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to start. I've, I've, I've got a couple things here. Um, I think the uh, one, this is a, a this is difficult uh, just in, in, in general. Um, I've, I've never been in a situation, obviously, where I've, where I've lost a, a, a child, but um, I know some of you in here have. Um, David, when his son died, he declared, I will go to him in 2 Samuel uh, 12, 23. And so maybe that's some insight into the question whether we'll be united with the children that we ever met, like we just talked about, um, the transfiguration, I think that, you know, we'll, we'll still know or recognize um, the disciples, they recognize the heroes in the faith, Moses, Elijah, when they met with Jesus. So um, maybe that could mean um, that, that it's, that we'll know each other, but it's not sure. Um, but I, I would think that we'd be united with our, with our loved one. Um, I, I, would, I would like to think that just because of hanging on to really what David said there, particularly, um, probably as the best place in Scripture. So um, that's what I would say there, guys, just to be concise. Well, I, would just, I mean, I think it's a two-part question. How will we know who's in heaven, even if we've never met? Well, number one, like you said, at Transfiguration, they knew, they knew, they recognized they Moses and yeah, Elijah. Never, never met them. They knew that that's who it was, and they were like, hey, let's go build a tent for him. So I think there's, there's confidence in that. I think Paul says it this way in Corinthians. He says, you know, now we know dimly, but then we will know fully. So when we get to heaven, I think there's a new revelation, a new understanding that God's going to allow us to have. And so there's going to be that um, full comprehension of things that on this side of, of heaven we don't know. I think the other side of the question, though, is, you know, what about my child that I've lost? You know, will my child be in heaven? And I think that's answered simply through the grace of God. Absolutely. Um, that child did not grow to the point of having the ability to have put faith in Christ, et cetera. Uh, you know, if it's a small child, certainly probably not even cognitively aware, depending on the age, then I think we say, well, that's the, simply the grace of God to say, I'll take care of that. They've not gotten to the point of where they could make a conscious knowledge. They didn't get to the point where a missionary had to come. You know, that's simply who our God is. And I think we need to remember that. So, will we know who, them? I think absolutely. Uh, will they be as a child or will they be a, a full grown adult? We don't know that. The Which Bible is another question. That. That's yeah. another one that we That's got. That's another on there, one. But, but, but yeah, I think, the, again, it's the idea that the grace of God will be more than sufficient in that moment for, for his people. That's good.
Hey, this is part two of Ask the Pastors. We did it the uh, first uh, Sunday after Christmas. It's actually part three, technically. We oh, just did. Part oh yeah, two. that's right. We did part. This is yeah, part this three. is this is part three, man. So anyway, uh, I'm going to give a shameless plug before we get started for the uh, the study we're going to start next Sunday called uh, the Gospel of Mark. You don't want to miss any of that. Mark's one of the most exciting books in the Bible. It's all about Jesus, and it's fast paced, and it's going to be great. So make sure you're here to get off on that study, the Gospel of Mark, starting next. Sunday, I appreciate I, it is called Remarkable Jesus. Get that remark. Okay. Anyway, I do appreciate these chairs uh, over in the other service. They had the small choir chairs, and these guys look good in the small chairs. I look like a can of busted biscuits in that chair, I'm just telling you. My, I'm, I'm rear end challenged. But anyway, so, all right. So, this is, uh, you sit in these questions. Uh, and they're very good questions, very sincere questions, and we will try our best to give very sincere biblical answers. Uh, so I love these guys. I love serving with these guys, and uh, it is my privilege and always has been my privilege to be uh, pastor at Aaron Lake Baptist Church, and I'm co-pastor and uh, getting ready to own out. But anyway, so uh, we're excited about this time. All right, said enough. All right, go ahead, throw up. Throw up a question. <laughs> I got this. It's you, it's you. <laughs> yeah, no, so, uh, my name's Jamie, and I am the recovery pastor here at Aaron Lakes. And to say that I am, uh, that I feel uh, under, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not edi- not uh, worthy to be here in front with these guys is an understatement. Um, yeah. But anyways, let's get straight to the first question. But you have the best beard out of all of us. Yeah, you I do. do. I, listen, I've been shaving for two years, and I cut myself both times. I'm still waiting for puberty to hit. <laughs> All right. Some, I struggle with wearing glasses. This is going so sideways. I, I know. Let's, let's get on it. So if the first did. question is, were the sons of God in Genesis angels or men that lusted after women and took them? Uh, good question that nobody knows, but we're going to try. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. So historically, I'm going to give you three, the three, there's three options here. All right, but Pastor Jeff literally just told you nobody has any idea. So let's keep that in mind. So uh, one, it could be angels. The second popular opinion is, is human judges or rulers. And then the third one are the descendants of Seth. So the truth is we have no idea who these individuals are, but the common theme in this text is, is that evil push them past what they were supposed to be doing. The, the divine boundaries is what people call it. And so that, that's, that's what I would say, which is what then led to the flood. It was just a wicked place. You yeah, I mean, it, there are three of those options. I think that a lot of it depends on how you read other parts of Scripture. When you get to Second Peter and Jude, there's reference there as well. And, and it's unclear. Nobody really knows. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult text. So the sons of Seth is one of the things that some people lean into. It's interesting because you said, well, the second opinion is human judges. The, the, actually, the most widely held traditional view is that it, they were some demon right. form of some kind. Yep. And we don't know exactly what that is, but if they were fallen angels, fallen, you know, which is what demons are, right? Then that's what many people think. That's what the early church believed. That's what Judaism taught at that time was that that's what they were. And when you read the rest of the Bible, particularly first Peter, second Peter and Jude, that's kind of what it comes to. And so the phrase sons of God is only, is only elsewhere used of angelic hosts. So it's interesting, there's God's son, but then when the phrase sons of God is used, it's usually referring to angelic beings. And so that's the phrase that's used there that has fallen, of course, if that's the case, and we've got a huge issue. But so the bigger issue is we don't know, but that's what most people lean into, at least traditionally. Well, you got, we keep in mind when this took place. Uh, this took place before the flood. And, uh, and so basically... Uh, and I do, because when, in the book of Job, we know that Satan uh, approached God, but it's not just Satan. If you'll read it carefully, it says Satan and the sons of God approach God. So, so that's talking about demons. So uh, the bottom line is the world had gotten so wicked uh, and almost out of control. And personally, I, I think these were demonic beings that uh, came down in, you know, human form, because we know uh, the devil can possess, you know, unbelievers and all that. 
But the bottom line is the world had gotten so wicked and so out of control that God pretty much blew the whistle and said, okay, everybody out of the pool, literally. <laughs> and uh, so... Or actually in the pool. Or in the pool. Yeah, everybody in the pool. So, he called Noah and yeah. them out the pool. Uh, it's a good question because, you know, you, you, as pastors, we get this all the time because people, you know, they start reading the Bible through every year, you know, in January. Then they get to that one and they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. What in the world is this all about? And we agree that we really don't, we really don't know other than the fact that when it took place, the world was very wicked. Yeah, I'm... I'm I, mean, I don't think there's much else we can say. That's so right. if, they fi- if y'all figure it out, let Jamie, us know. Jamie, move on, Stop this I thought you were fixing to ask me to answer that. <laughs> Jamie, can uh, you please on. give us a theology? Yes, approach? Jamie. What do you think, buddy? <laughs> I agree with all of y'all. <laughs> okay. Danny, what do you think? What he said. Okay. What he said. Yeah. Okay. Next right. question. Uh, what specifically go. can a Christian do to overcome spiritual apathy? That's a good one. Uh, we kind of addressed this a little bit over in the other service about depression. I'm going to really kind of turn this over to Andrew a little bit. And, uh, but, uh, I, and I did want to say this, and, and I said it over there, and I want to say this over here as well. Uh, Andrew and I, being co-pastors right now, uh, we, have, we have different giftedness. And, and it's a beautiful thing to see, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. I love you, and I've always loved you. Uh, but I'm just a gospel preacher. I told him over there, man, I'm just cornbread and creek water, man. Where's the I cornbread? Just, We've been asking oh, well, if you it's cornbread in, it's and creek in water. Here. <laughs> it's in here, but it's, it's that yeah. busted biscuit. So I'm just, I'm a gospel <laughs> preacher. So, you, you know, you come to me with those kind of questions about apathy and depression and all that. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I love you. I love you with all my heart, but I'm just going to tell you, hey, man, this is what God says, and why should you listen to me? You're going to listen to him. But Andrew cares Andrew cares for this church, I'm going to be honest with you, in a deeper way uh, than me. And, and it's not that one's right and one's wrong. It's just that the giftedness, and Andrew cares so much about the families. This is, this is, why, he, this is why his emphasis is on disciples. When I pastored here, my, dis- my emphasis was on evangelism, tell people about Jesus. His, his emphasis is on discipleship and growing people where we'll tell people about Jesus naturally in our walk. So... Having said all that, uh, you know, how do you overcome spiritual apathy? Andrew, I'm just going to kind of turn a little bit over this to you and, and you talk about these, these kind of things because you're good at it. All right. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I mean it. But let, let me, let me, let's, let's get to it here. So I think there's, there's really three things that I, I, that I think about this and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep it brief because I want, I want you guys to, to talk about this. Um, one, I think these are helpful questions to consider. Spiritual apathy I mean, that, that's really a going through the motions kind of thing. Um, there, there's, a, there's a book that I've been trying to read. I picked it up about four different times, and I'm trying to read it. It's, it's written at a very uh, interesting level. It's, it's called Overcoming Apathy, and so that, that might be something you want to you wanna look at. But one of the things that I, that I think is I, I would ask myself these three questions. Am I living in unconfessed sin? As we know, sin separates us from God. We, we know that. Um, and, and 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So I think that's number one. And I think for most of us, that's the big one. Are we willing to, to, uh, to be bold enough to ask God, if we're going through a season like that, to say, God, is there something in my life that I'm not giving over to you? Is there something that I've become comfortable with in my life, a sin in my life that I've not confessed over to you? Help reveal that to me. Give me that. So that's, so that's the one. Um, the, the other one is, is have I neglected the practice of spiritual disciplines? And I think that's probably just as big as the first. You know, what, what practices are we putting in? Am, am I reading my Bible every day? Because I, I'll be honest with you, and I, I think all of us up here will agree with this. There's days we read our Bible and we're just like, I got nothing here. But we, you push through those moments. You continue on with those daily rhythms and those disciplines. There's a reason why they call it spiritual disciplines. They're They're hard. There are difficult things. So scripture memory, reading the Bible, um, praying, you know, different spiritual disciplines. And then ask yourself this third question. So we got, am I living in unconfessed sin? Am I practicing spiritual disciplines? Or have I neglected the practice of spiritual disciplines? And then the third one is what fills my mind daily? What am I taking in? Um, Thursday night, we had a, a staff meeting, and, and Pastor Jeff, in, in, in the beginning of the meeting, said, you know, he said, I realize that I watch way too much news, and it's, a, it's, it's just consumed me to the point where I just get upset. Well, well, that's what we're talking about there. What are we taking in? Not that that's a bad thing, but have we allowed something to consume us that takes the place of 
what God should be doing in our life and giving us that fulfillment. So that's, there's a lot of other things there, but I, that's, I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. Go ahead, Danny. Well, one thing, one thing I found, too, is one thing you can add to the list is serving. Mm-hmm. When you're serving others and beginning to serve, it's, it's hard to bring light into somebody else's life without bringing it into your own. Uh, one of the best questions that was ever asked to me was asked by a, a worship pastor many years ago down in Macon, Georgia. He asked me, on, he says, do you worship on Sunday mornings? And I started to say, well, that's the stupidest question I've ever been asked, but the Lord held my tongue. And I had to admit to myself, you know, sometimes I'm not worshiping on Sunday mornings, and I'm that's the worship word. leader. That's a good worship. word. Because, you know, I get so wrapped up in the mechanics making sure we dot the I's and cross the T's. And we want to do things with excellence, but we can get so consumed with that that we begin to get apathetic, even in ministry. I know you don't want to hear that from your worship pastors, but there are times we, we struggle just like everybody else, and we have to battle apathy sometimes. Uh, I have a thing that I, I come in with the, uh, with the praise team on Sunday night. By the time Wednesday night, the third rehearsal on Wednesday night rolls around, I come in and I say, I hate music. <laughs> you know, and, and they just kind of laugh. They say, we know what you mean. You love music, but you just hate getting tired of it sometimes. And I, I, and I, I love what we do here. And, uh, but, you know, it, it, apathy is something that we have to really, really guard against. And once again, if we serve, I do believe that uh, that helps relieve that, that boredom and along, uh, coupled with the, uh, the disciplines that Andrew was talking about. So I'm just, Good just a couple of things to think about, too. I mean, apathy by definition means without passion you know, without pathos, right? And it, it means I don't care. It's a person who, who gets to the point where they say, I don't, I don't want to eat. But you know you need to. So what do you do? You, you, have to, you have to do it anyway, in a sense. And I think that's kind of what we've been saying. But, and I think one of the things I would, I would add, because it says, what specifically can I do? I would say, number one, admit. I think acknowledging that you're apathetic is, is key. To say, hey, I've got an issue. And I think that's a great place to be at because if you didn't have apathy, if you didn't recognize you had apathy, then that would be a bad place to be. So I think, hey, that's a good place. Take that to the cross and say, all right, Lord, help me in this. But I think, you know, if you're not eating, at some point you have to sit down and eat. You, You have to take the spoon and stick it in. And I think for us, spiritually, sometimes what we have to do is is go through the disciplines and listen to the word. And, and I would even say, you know, find some good preaching to listen to throughout the week. Uh, we're not the only ones out there who you're ever going to hear rightly divide the word of God. Now that doesn't mean everybody rightly diverts, divides the word of God, but you know, find a podcast, listen to good biblical preaching, you know, download John Piper or Tony Evans or David Jeremiah and listen to good faithful preaching. Cause it may be that something they say will, will kickstart it for you. If we're dry and dull and boring, maybe they'll help, right? But, but I think there's something about that. Get into the Word, uh, get into prayer, do those things. And what I think will happen is it will trigger your appetite again. And then that will fuel the passion to continue to serve God. I, and again, that's why I say get into the Word so the Word can get into you. You can't do that if you're not doing it. And, yeah. and I think that's the other thing. And I would say, too, plug here for the discipleship groups. Amen. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, getting yourself around people men and men, women with women, who are equipping others and, and each other and growing together in our faith. That, that's why it's so vital. Um, I mean, I think everybody in this room should be signing up for that, by the way. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to push that, but it's that important. You don't understand it until you do it. But, but that helps with that is being around people who are heading in the same direction, who can encourage you, can come alongside you and help pick you up, not bring you down. Yeah, I want to, uh, I mean, I will put a shameless plug in for your discipleship groups as well because I had gotten so apathetic in my and, and lethargic in my Bible reading in fact, it's, 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 if there's one thing that's it's easy to let slide it's that well I just don't got I don't have time today and uh, when you're in a D group and you're going to meet with those guys every week and you got to share it holds your feet to the fire it really does and all those guys, the guys who are in my first group and my second group presently right now, they will testify to that fact. It's just, it's, it helps you develop that discipline of getting into the Word daily so the Word can get Yeah, in. and even if you can't go to that, because I know it's on a Thursday night, and then we can move on to the next thing. But I'm just saying, I, sign up for that so we can yeah. at least know you're interested, and I'll get you connected in, okay? You don't have to be, I mean, I want you to be at that meeting. It's important. But, I mean, seriously, if, that, if, if you find yourself in a situation like where you're dealing with spiritual apathy and just feeling like you're alone in it, then... 
Come on, we got you. Yeah, and, and we got to understand that whether we like it or not, life pretty much is the same old, same old. You know, I get up at the same time, I eat kind of the same breakfast, and I go, I sit in my same recliner. I do, you know, it's the same. We go to work, in and out, and life becomes the same old, same old. And uh, and because that's true, uh, we got to be on guard. You know, the Bible says, think, think. You know, whatever things are excellent and pure and righteous and good and beautiful, think on on these things. And uh, and and you know, because life is same old, same old. Uh, you know. Be aware, and like Chris said, if you're aware of it, then uh, you probably, you know, you're on, you're on a good, you're on a good track. Amen. But uh, just understand that you don't live the Christian life by your feelings. You can't do that. You, you, you're fickle. Feelings are up and down and in and out and off and on. I mean, so, you know, there, and, I, and we've said this, you know, I feel like sometimes, you know, I'm full of the spirit and, you know, all of that. But then I feel like sometimes God's on the other side of Mars somewhere. And I have to come to grips that no matter how I feel, I have what I have because God said so. Yeah. Amen. Man, I'm glad y'all didn't ask me to answer that because I'm not even sure what apathy means. So moving on. <laughs> Am I alone? Does anybody else not know what it means? He doesn't care. Am I the only one on the stage? Yeah. Me. Okay. That's all right. Uh, Next question. What is the point of baptism? All right, Baptist. All right. Well... It's a symbol, and it's a, and a, you, never, you never find anybody in the New Testament that had, a, that had an encounter with Jesus that didn't follow it up with baptism. Uh, baptism doesn't save you. We know that, and I think that's why the question, I get the question, what's the point of baptism? doesn't save me. Uh, you know, Thomas right now just thrilled my heart, made my day by getting baptized. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more yes. time for that. Yes, yes sir. Uh, I can, I can also say, what's the point of my wedding ring? Doesn't, it doesn't marry me. Uh, it doesn't, it's just a piece of jewelry. It, it doesn't do anything. It has, no, it has no power in it. If I take my ring off, I'm, I'm still married, right, sweetheart? I'm still married. You know, it does, but you better not take you know, it off, it right, Phyllis? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Good my wedding ring doesn't hesitate, marry right me. There, by the way. It has no power in it. But... There's a lot of power in it because if you didn't know anything about me, you would know I'm married. Why? Because I have a symbol on my finger. Baptism is the same way. Baptism is a symbol. Baptism is saying, listen, I want y'all to know. This is why we do it public, and this is why we do it immersing. We want you to know that what Jesus did for me, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and this is my public profession that I am not ashamed of of the gospel of Jesus. Yeah, I think to add to that, not only is it a symbol, not only is it a public profession, but it's an act of obedience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jesus yeah. did this himself, and so he instituted that. And I think that's the other part that we overlook. I mean, um, you know, people ask me, they say, well, why don't you get baptized? It doesn't, like you said, I mean, it doesn't equate necessarily to salvation. No, but obedience is, is really critical there, and it's key. And so um, it, it's an act of obedience for someone who genuinely believes in Christ. I think one other thing I would add is that in American culture, baptism is not a big deal. What I mean by that is your life is not on the line. Uh, you're not going to lose your job. Your family is not going to, you know, kick you out. But you remember in the culture in which Jesus was baptized as a new believer, when the people were coming through and putting their faith in Christ, to be public down by the river and be publicly baptized into the way the Jewish culture ostracized those people. This was, this was saying, I'm on team Jesus regardless. And I think that's a huge deal. Yeah, and now people are like, yeah, I don't want to get my hair wet if they had hair. And, and so they, you know, it's not a big deal, but, but in that culture, it was a huge deal. I mean, people died because they did that. They lost their jobs. It was, it was a significant step of saying, I'm on this team and I'm on this team no matter what happens. And I think we've lessened that in American culture. And so it's like, why, why go through the, I mean, we don't even, you know, we celebrate it here, but a lot of, it's like, it's just not a big thing. And I think we've forgotten the significant impact it was in the original church, in the early church. And we we need to remember the significant weight of what it signified. I mean, that's a good word. I had a lady, and when I was at Bonnie Dune, her name was Kim, and we baptized her. And, uh, she looked at me and she said, you know, when I go under these waters, uh, my family is going to disown me. Mm -hmm. Right. And they did. Yeah. For the rest of her life, 
Her family never had anything else to do with her ever. But, hey, that's what Jesus said. That's right. Jesus said, I come, and I'm not going to put families together sometimes. Sometimes they're going to tear them apart. But she was willing to do that. And that's such a good word because for us, big deal. But for so many people all over the world, it is, it is a matter of life and death. So some friends of ours uh, were international missionaries for four years in Eastern Asia. And what happened is, you know, people would come to faith in Christ. And they said, hey, we want to be baptized. But they knew that that was literally going to be a life and death situation because of that part of the world. So what they did was they gathered. The, the pastor traveled over through the night. We went into a house, stayed there for a couple of days so nobody saw him. The church began to gather in this house over a couple of days because, you know, you can't have 30 people show up all at once. The government will see that, right? So they would gather. They literally would do baptism in this huge flower pot, baptize these new believers, and then over the next couple of days they would go back home, and then in the cover of night he left. That's sick. That's huge. And yet we're like, you know, I don't know if I want to go get wet or not. Like, did Jesus die for you or not? This is what he wants you to do is obedience. Remember the impact. I mean, here are people literally in these cultures that are giving their life, putting their life on the line to be obedient to faith in Christ. And I think we just need to, we need to lift that up and, and celebrate and that. And I think so. the same can be true about coming to church. I mean, uh, I mean, let's just be honest. Some of us, either last night or this morning, we're contemplating, do we even want to be here today? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, just call it like it is. But yet, you know, there's stories like that. Those are real things that happen in real places every single day. Yep. I know people who are in those areas, and it is a real thing. And yet we sit here and say, well, let me make sure the coffee's good, or let me make sure this. I mean, we yeah. just, it, we just, it's just different here. Yeah. But, but, I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's you, a great you, question. You kind of want some of that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't been baptized scripturally, and that is by immersion, uh, you need to do that. Uh, you, some of you have been putting that off. Some of you are saying, it's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. But s since you've gotten saved, now some of you were raised in a system where your parents meant well. They baptized you as a baby because they wanted to make sure you were in. They were very sincere. And I'm not downing your parents, but they were sincerely wrong. There's no instance of baptism, infant baptism in all of Scripture. Uh, and so some of you got baptized in that system. Some of you got baptized in another system. Nothing wrong with getting baptized as a child if you understand exactly what that's all about. But some of you have not been baptized since you've been saved. And I'm telling you, you think it's no big deal, but it is hurting you spiritually. Get baptized. Yeah. Lead us on. All right. Thank we got you. water over here. <laughs> it's warm, too. All right. And closed. Nothing's stopping you today. Right. Do it right now. So, next question. Do our animals go with us when Jesus comes? Which time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, Andrew, I think, uh, approached this question, but I mean, think about I it. I mean, yeah. uh, we, I love, I, we love our animals. We love our pets, right? But a, a pet is a creature. I don't mean that in a mean way. That sounds harsh. But we have a soul. We have a spirit. And so when we die, we got to be with the Father, right? I don't know that the Bible addresses that from from an animal perspective. Will there be animals in heaven? I'm sure there will be. Will it be my well, there horses, Will it be my dog that. that just died six months ago? I, I doubt it. No offense to Cooper, but I don't I don't see that. But um, you can read those uh, in your text. And you want to add to that? I mean, no, it's a, I kind mean, of a quick question. I don't I mean, mean that in a bad way. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, I, I think know. I think there will be animals in heaven. Uh, I just don't I don't see it being the same way. What I love for I'm our not little, sure about cats. Our um, no, cats. now I will say this. That, Definitely not. I will say I, this. Know, I'm not um, sure. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, the, the, Just joking. He's not here today, <laughs> nor is nor is the dog. But Jeff Stoltz's dog. Last time I gave a gospel invitation, the dog came forward and kneeled at the altar. That's all I got to say. <laughs> That's, true. Um, That's true. It happened. That did happen. But what I was going to say was, I, I would love, and, and and Brittany and I, we we talk about this too. I would love for little Toby James, our our little six seven year old dog, to be in heaven with us. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, when I see it's, it's, it's about souls. And so well, I, th I think the question kind of, you know, goes on, you know, I want all my loved ones to be with me. I, I, I want all of that. You know, I want my, you know, my wife, my kids and my dogs and, and all of that. And I get that. Let, let me just say this. You never read in scripture where heaven is ever a disappointment. 
Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Heaven is not disappointing in any way, shape, or form. So, well, can we can we just listen listen to what? Am I going to have this? Am I going to have that? Am I going to have this? Am I going to have that? What you just said, I'm glad you said it that way because what we do when we make statements like that, we make it about us. Church, heaven is not about us. It is about Jesus. It is about being in the presence of God. And, and that, is the, that is the essence of what it is. And so we really, really have to be careful about reading things into the Bible that make it more about us when uh, really... It ain't about us. We're just, like I told the first service, we're just thankful that we get a seat on the, on the ride. I mean, yeah. so. That deserves a big amen. Amen? <laughs> All right. right, onward. All right, moving on. What happens to children below the age of accountability during the rapture? Are they left? Pastor Danny, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Danny's like, What? Chris, you got a good answer on that. Well, I think I'm not sure that the, the person crafted the question well, maybe, but notice what it says. What happens to children below the age of accountability? So if you think about what an age of accountability is, and the way we explain it is, there, is there a point at which a person becomes um, responsible for knowing who Christ is and having some kind of faith response? If they're below that, that means they're below the point at which they should have had the decision. And so I would say during the rapture or whatever, they're, 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 you know, they're raptured with the church. If they're asking the question a different way, what happens if they're above the age of accountability, then, then they're in trouble. So I, mean, I think that goes into why we do evangelism, why we do vacation Bible school, why we build ministries that share the gospel. But if they're below the age of accountability, if that is such a you know, thing, which we use that term, it's not a biblical phrase, but it's kind of a concept, then they would be, they would be raptured with the church. Yeah, age, you, age of accountability, just so you know, that's, that's a... a Theological concept where it's like can, when a child comes to truly be able to grasp the truth, and that, that's a some people say that's a hard line at 12 because that's how old Jesus was in the temple. I don't know, um, but I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't think there's a line. I think that's different per there's child. Not so there's not anybody, a biblical anybody thing raise, there. Anybody raised in a Baptist church or a Southern Baptist church where the age accountability was 12? Look at all the hands. Yes, when I turned 12. My mama was standing beside me, and she said, you want to go to the front? I said, what? You want to go to the front? It's time to go to the front. You're 12 years old. You go to the front. You need to tell the pastor you're coming to the front. Let's go to the front. You need to take the pastor by the hand go to the front and tell him you want to get baptized. And I went up there, and I went to the front. And pastor said, Brother Jeff came to the front. And all the old ladies came by after the service. Oh, I'm so glad you went to the front. You went to the front. You got baptized. <laughs> I don't know where we got that, folks. But that ain't, that ain't scriptural. Yeah. Yeah. The age of accountability can be, and a lot of there, it, it, a lot of it depends when that child comes from homes like yours that hears a lot about Jesus. Then I believe at an earlier, earlier age they will come to faith in Christ. And then there are kids that have never, ever even heard of the name of Jesus. So age of accountability is kind of a, a weird, a weird thing. And all I know is God is a righteous judge. Okay. I think we have to be careful, and I'll just say this as a warning, and then we'll go to the next question. We have to be careful that we don't put some false, abstract idea there, because a lot of people would say, well, then why do we share the gospel at all? If we tell them, then they're, they need a response. Well, I think we're called to share the gospel because we're called to share the gospel. And I think, you know, some people would almost look at that and say, well, we don't want to tell them too much. No, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The, the, the heavens have declared the righteousness of God and that we, we need to make sure that we're sharing it. So, and I, I would say here, make sure that we don't go, well, we just, they'll be okay. You know, we as parents are responsible to share the gospel and lead our children to faith. Amen. The church is to come alongside of that and let's not worry, well, are, you know, are they six? And that's therefore the age of it. No, share the gospel. Don't push them and have a false decision, if you will. But we need to make sure that we're sharing the gospel and leading and, 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 and making sure that children have the opportunity to come to faith. I, think I, that's hear, the I hear parents line. say, well, they don't understand enough. Um, I got to tell you, I've been, I've been saved over 50 years. I still don't understand it. <laughs> right? Can you tell me you understand how Jesus died for our sin 2,000 years ago and it's, it accounts to my, my righteousness? No, you don't understand that. You can't take that in. That's why we have to do it by faith. Yeah. But don't ever make the mistake and say, well, my, my child 
doesn't understand enough. That's why Jesus said you've got to become like a child if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven. So lead your children to Jesus. Good answer. So uh, just one question to add to that. So we talked a lot about age 12 and under or whatever, you know, throw them numbers out. What about the, the 50 year old that has grown up never being able to comprehend because of mental illness or whatever? I believe he's going to. I think that's again the, the grace of God. If you, yeah. let's say you have a special needs person who's grown up into adulthood, if you will, and they still, for lack of a better way of describing it, have the, the mental capacity maybe of a child, then I would say that's, again, the grace of God. Yeah. No different situation. Yeah. Our God loves us, and he, you know, if, if sin has so corrupted our bodies that our body, mentally, physically, whatever, is not able to do that, I think that's, we, we give that to the grace of God. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good word. Good stuff. Uh, next question, man. It's a long one. Uh, you want to read that one, Chris? <laughs> can I borrow your glasses? <laughs> Actually, I can read it if it's over there. It's right here. I can't read. <laughs> All right. Moving I, on. I, I think this goes along with what we just kind of answered, to be you honest already with read you. read that? Well, it does. Let, let's let Jamie read it. Go ahead, Jamie. Can you read you that? You want me to read it, brother? No, I got it. <laughs> okay. I got there it. You go. I can't really All see right. that far. I just, it's literally right here. So life has been cut short by abortions and partial birth abortions. Well, those millions of aborted babies still be babies or the age they would be when the role is called up yonder to possibly be united with the mother who, who aborted them and then turn her life over to the Lord Jesus. That's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Very sincere question. I love the Ray Bolt song that uh, he wrote, uh, Sometimes They Cry. And it was written by a, a nurse who worked in an abortion clinic and said, sometimes when we are aborting these babies, they're crying. And uh, he also wrote a song called, I wonder, you know, what was I supposed to be? Mm -hmm. I wonder when we get to heaven, will, the, will we see a lot of people saying, what was I supposed to be? Was I supposed to be a doctor maybe to find a disease for cancer or the cure for cancer? Or was I supposed to be a leader of some kind. What, what was I supposed to be, Jesus? You know, yeah. uh, will, will we see a lot of lot of people asking Jesus, "What was I? I never got the chance. I never drew my first breath because I never got the chance." Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> God loves babies yes. and children, and uh, you don't have to worry about that. Your baby is in heaven. Mm. There are some of you here. You've had miscarriages and uh there are babies in baby land you'll be reunited there's no doubt about it what age i don't know but the bottom line is but i want to say a word about those of you that have had abortions god's a god of grace yes. and um uh, don't understand that you know understand that god has forgiven you he loves you you called out for forgiven forgiveness he loves you uh, we all sin, and we all come short of the glory of God. Uh, but uh, if, you've, if you've had an abortion, uh, understand this, that Jesus forgives all of our sin, and he casts us as far as the east is from the west. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. I'd be down Amen. to the beach like everybody else. But if we don't believe in the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, then what are we doing here? That's a good word. I, I want to um, I echo just a little bit of that. The, the Bible doesn't give us much of an answer to this, but like you, like you said, I mean, I think it relates a little bit to what we just got done talking about. Uh, the Bible does talk about how when we get to heaven, we'll have glorified bodies. Yes. So I see no reason why to say that, um, that those, those babies will be there. Again, what age? No idea. Um, but... Uh, it New glorified body in heaven. That, that's 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 where I that's where I go. If we if we want to look at this directly, but um, but I agree with I'm I'm with you. I think um, in the first service, uh, for those who might not have been over there, we had two questions that came up that I think are similarly related. One was, what about creation cremation, and you know what about you know how does that work, and you know and then the other one was well well I know people in heaven that kind of thing. And I think the question here is a little bit, okay, well, I didn't get to know my baby when well, I know I'm in heaven, you know, 
when the disciples are at the transfiguration, they recognize Moses, who they had never met, and Elijah, whom they had never met. So I think there's the trust that they will recognize. Uh, even people that you didn't know on earth in heaven. I mean, as I quoted in the first service, Paul said, you know, now we know dimly, but then we will know fully, for we will know him as he is. So I think there's that great hope. But also, if, if we go to heaven, um, you know, our spirit goes to heaven, be with the Lord, absent from the body, it's present with the Lord. We know that. We know one day there's going to be a glorified body that we're going to get according to 1 Corinthians 15, etc. At, at that point, what's that going to look like? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. But there's that promise and that hope. And I think when we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, right? And I think there's great wisdom. And if the God who could create us in the first place can take care of that in the last place. Amen. That'll preach. Yeah, I preach. I had a good Amen. preaching. That's it. I, 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 I said this over there, I, I, and I, I'll say it right here. Uh, I've, been, I've been preaching almost 50 years. And uh, when I first started out in the ministry, uh, at a funeral especially, uh, heaven was, I preached that heaven was a place with uh, walls and streets of gold and gates of pearl. Heaven is all of that. It is a place. It's not a crutch. It's not a state of mind. It has a place. The, the foundation is built by God himself. It is a place. Make no mistake about that. But now, as I get older, <laughs> and, all, and some of us older people in this room, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. As I get closer to that day, heaven is still a place. But what I think about is the reunion in heaven. My mom and my daddy, loved ones that have gone on before. The book of Revelation talks extremely about they shall, the sun will never strike them, and they will wipe, and God will wipe all the tears from their eyes. We're not spirits floating around. We're, we are they, and there's the tremendous fellowship in heaven, a reunion in heaven that is tremendous waiting for us. Amen. Amen. So next question. That was another long one. I heard that you can find Christ in every chapter of the Bible. I sure would love to have a written list of which attributes is displayed in each book. For example, in Mark, Christ, the suffering servant. I think this would be a very encouraging. I think this would be very encouraging. First of all, you need to read my dissertation. They and, then, laugh. and then Jeff, and that's what my <laughs> dissertation was on, was how to preach Christ from the Old Testament. I was going to say, they laugh. You're being so, dead serious. I'm being serious. I mean, no, 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 you're gonna, uh, if you want a good sleep, read my dissertation. Right. But uh, anyway. I'm glad you asked that question. Here we go. Y'all ready been for this? waiting for this Hang all week. Hang on. I've been, listen. All right. By the way, if you want a copy of this, I'll give you a copy for that. Just let us know. We'll give it to the office. All right. Here we go. Jesus. In every book of the Bible, I'm going to do this real quick. Genesis, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. Leviticus, he is the high priest. Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the pillar by night. Deuteronomy, he is the one greater than Moses. Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. Judges, he's the righteous judge. Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. First and second Samuel, he's the true king. First and second Kings, he's the blessing of obedience and the judge of disobedience. First and second Chronicles, he is both both king and priest. Ezra, he is restorer of the temple. Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the wall. Esther, he's the protector of his people. Job, he's the living redeemer. Psalms, he is our shepherd. Proverbs, he's the source of wisdom. Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life. Song of Solomon, he is our lover. Isaiah, he is wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, mighty God. Jeremiah, he's the one who weeps for us. Lamentation, he assumes God's wrath for us. Ezekiel, he is the son of man. Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fire. Hosea, he's the faithful husband who loves and an unfaithful wife. Joel, he's the descending spirit. Amos, he is the burden bearer. Obadiah, he's the judge who is mighty to save. Jonah, he's the God of second chances. Micah, he casts our sin in the depths of the sea. Naam, he is the avenger of the people. Habakkuk, he's the rejoicing and strength. Zephaniah, he is the restorer of the faithful. Haggai, he's the restorer of our worship. Zechariah, he is the Messiah pierced for our sins. Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. Matthew, he is the king. Mark, he's a suffering savior. Luke, he's a son 
son of man. John, he's the son of God in flesh. Acts, he's the indwelling spirit. Romans, he's the righteousness of God. First Corinthians, he's the rock. Second Corinthians, he's the down payment for what's to come. Galatians, he's our very life. Ephesians, he's the head of the church. Philippians, he's the joy of our life. Colossians, he's the supreme Lord of all. First Thessalonians, he's our comfort in the last days. Second Thessalonians, he's our returning king. First Timothy, he's rebuilder of the church. Second Timothy, he's the leader of leaders. Titus, he's the foundation of truth. Philemon, he is our mediator. Hebrews, he is our high priest. And keep going. And I dropped the All paper. Right, here we go. <laughs> and take a breath. Take a in, breath. You got it. And James, <laughs> Come he on, is a faithful in action. In First Peter, he's a living stone. Second Peter, he's a savior, not willing that any should perish. First John, he's a source of all fellowship. Second John, he is love. First John, he is source of all truth. Jude, he is the one who protects us from stumbling. And Revelation, he's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha Come and Omega, the beginning and the end, who makes all things new. Glory to God, <laughs> Jesus, in every book of the Bible. Now listen, if, if you had done that from memory, man, that would have been incredible. Say, <laughs> he did that through Google. I ain't got that, brother. We would go from Baptist to Pentecostal Woo! up in here. You come to a question and answer period and a revival breaks out. <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not adding to that. That was pretty good. I'm, I'm good. I'm I good. On that, baby. Jamie? I'm Did good. you repeat that? <laughs> um, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you? Uh, I, I lost everything after Exodus. Can you go back Could and you? review that? Yeah. <laughs> We'll make that available for everybody. There you go. I think it is a great reminder um, that Christ is found throughout the entire Bible. Too so often we think, well, he didn't show up till Matthew. Yeah. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 24, verse 44, the, he's, he's asking, he's talking to the guys on the Emmaus Road after the resurrection. And they're like, you know, do you not know what's happened? Blah, blah, blah. And the Bible says that beginning with the law and the prophets, he began to teach them Old Testament survey. That's basically what it says. And he, he showed that how all of that pointed to him. That's right. Uh, Christ is the fulfillment of the Bible. Amen. And when you see it all the way through, he's not in every verse, but every verse, every story, every part of it points us to him uh, about the, the thread, even from the very beginning. And so, uh, it, but, and it will revolutionize how you read your Bible when you're like, how does this connect to the, to the one who would die for my sin. It's a beautiful thing. And it's not just, I mean, it's beautiful to do it, but just make sure that we, as we read, we read looking, not, not that he's under every little rock there, but every story connects to the bigger story, which is fulfilled in Christ. So. Amen, that's right. um, we got time. I'm going to go ahead and um, have the, the band can, can get in place. We got time for one more question. Yeah, well, we've we'll got 42 them. questions left. Right. Yeah. Well, I didn't, want to I didn't see We got one that came while. in by text during the service, but, We're not but I'm not smart enough to answer I'm that one. I'm not either. So, so uh, <laughs> anyway. All right. Onward. Let's do, uh, we'll do one more, and then um, we'll. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. We had that one earlier, so we, that means we got through all of them. So that's right. good. We've done them all. We, well, maybe close. So. Yeah. yeah. We didn't right. answer the land of Nod, but nobody knows anything else yeah, about Yeah, I was going to say, there is one question about the land of Nod. We have no idea. And um, the person who submitted that question, I've already talked to. So, there's well, your and then it goes back to the old question: Where did Cain get his wife? Yeah. Well, dude, she was either his cousin or his sister, <laughs> one or the other. So, but here, and I told my wife that. My wife said, Phyllis said, "Where did Cain? You are you telling me he married his sister?" And I said, "Baby, if we can trace all of our ancestry back, it's going to come back to Adam." Baby, you and I, I have been married to you. You are my sister, and I've been married to you all of these years, and ain't nothing weird about that, okay? And the reason why I say that that is got a little we, awkward, but we, yeah. I know it did get real awkward. Uh, but we all have to realize we all came. Brittany, I'm not going to explain it to you that way. <laughs> we all came from the, uh, the sin nature of Adam. All of us. That's why Jesus had to die for all of us. Okay, I'm going to do this. Let's all. Uh, we want to. We got one up oh, there. Let's okay. let's do this one oh, just one, for the okay. sake of it being up there. <laughs> the cremation one. I got uh, my timer just went off, so we'll just be we'll be fast. So. We're fine. So, last question: Is there a biblical viewpoint regarding cremation? 
Well, uh, so we, we tried to address this in the first service. The Bible does not really give a viewpoint on cremation. Um, so it doesn't really say one thing or the other. A couple of things to note. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, usually cremation was only used of serious offenders. Uh, for example, Achan in, in the Old Testament and Joshua. Uh, you know, we see a couple of examples like that. It seems that most Jews in that culture believed uh, that the God was going to resurrect the body and the soul, and so they didn't want to damage the one, and so they put him in a tomb. And we see that Abraham had a tomb. I think you mentioned that earlier. So, yeah. predominantly in that culture, they did not generally cremate. Okay, but, but they did from time to time. It was part of that. By the time you get to the New Testament, uh, Christians kind of followed that precedent. It was what the, the standards of the day were, uh, possibly, again, because they saw the body, uh, you know. And, they, and, of course, you know, the, the phrase in the Bible, you know, asleep in, in Jesus. You know, we're, they're asleep, so we're just going to leave their body and one day resurrect it. Right. That being said, I, I don't think there's any reason to not cremate. I, I don't see that being a problem. God created us, earth the earth, ashes, ashes, dust, dust, all that stuff. But here's the thing. If, if God is going to redeem our body at the end, right, glorified body in heaven, whatever, then, you know, those who are burned in a car accident or a house fire or war, which we have many guys and gals right. who have been dealing with that, um, you know, drowned at sea, God's going to redeem that body and put it yeah. back, you know. It goes I, back to that whole God's going to re recreate God, it. God's going to take care there. of it. So, and I think the other thing, too, I'll add to this that I thought was interesting. One of, we, we had this talk in, in, uh, back when I was at, working on my master's at seminary. And, and one of the, this question came up. And, and our professor noted, he said, you know, the, typically cremation was actually a pagan practice mm -hmm. um, back, in the, back in the day. Um, but then if you, if, if, and then he pointed this out, he said, but if you look at embalming, that was made popular by the Egyptians, which are then also pagan. Yeah. So I don't think there's a, like I said, I think it just goes back to that. So there's food for thought for what it's worth. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, wh whatever you decide to do is your opinion, but God's going to restore it and um, all will be made new. Amen. Y'all enjoyed this? All right. Awesome. All right. Okay. All right. Um, we will, we will do this again, you know, especially probably after the uh, uh, Christmas uh, sermon and all that. Uh, between Christmas and New Year's, we, that's when we started this, and that's, it's always good. I want to just say this uh, before we, we walk out of here. Um, you're not going to have all your questions answered in this life. You're, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I don't know if if you ever anybody anybody ever raised teenagers here. You raised teenagers, okay? Yeah. Um, what what happens when you raise teenagers? When my when my kids were teenagers, come to me and say, "Dad, can we go over to so and so's house?" And I'd say, "No, you can't." And then they would say, "Why? Why?" Well, then sincerely, I would start telling them why. I'm your dad. I don't know them yet. Not right now. I don't know who they are. Let me get to know them a little bit better. I'm not saying you can't forever, but right now I protect you. That's my, that's my job. And I would tell them sincerely why, only to have them say, that's not fair. At which point you want them to stop being teenagers because you want them to stop living. But anyway, so even if God would come to us and tell us why something's happened. It wouldn't satisfy us on this side of heaven. And we're never going to have all of our answer, questions answered on this side of seven, heaven because of one simple fact that God says, right now, I want you to trust me by faith. I'm not going to answer all your questions. I want you to trust me by faith. Because one day you will see by sight, but right now until that day, trust me by faith. Would you stand please, every head bowed, every eye closed. Have you ever done that? You know, we've talked a lot about heaven and we've talked about all of these kind of things, but do you know that heaven is your home? Do you know where you're going to be after you die? It's not if you die, it's when you die. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if heaven is my home. I'm not sure if I've ever really trusted Jesus, but I'd like to. 
Well, with every head bowed, every eye closed, first of all, just admit you're a sinner, just like all of us. You're a sinner. You know it. I know it. We're all, you're, in a, you're in a safe place right now because we've all sinned. Every one of us sinned, and we've come short of the glory of God. Admit that. Confess that. Confess it to Jesus, and then ask him to forgive you, and he will. Every single time, he will. And then by faith, not understanding, not knowledge, but by faith, ask him to come in your heart. Pray a simple prayer like this with me. If you've never done this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sin. Jesus, thank you for loving me, and thank you for dying for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. And Lord Jesus, come into my life. Give me a home in heaven when I die, but walk with me and guide me in this life until I see you face to face. Every head's bowed, every eye closed. Anybody prayed that prayer or something like it? Would you raise your hand up in the building? I prayed that prayer with you, Pastor, and I really meant it. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that um, we trust you. We have questions. And right now, we don't get all the answers. But that's okay. Because one day, we'll see you face to face. One day, if we know you, all of these things will make sense. Right now, we're so close to the battlefield, we don't see the big picture. But you always have. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this staff. Lord, I, I love being a part of this. I love being a part of this church. Lord, as we worship together, speak to our hearts. And Lord, when we leave this place, may we go as disciples who seek to share the gospel. In Jesus' name.
great to be here. Let's just, let's dismiss in prayer today. Lord, we thank you that your promises are yes and amen. Lord, we may not always, as Pastor Jeff said, we don't have all the answers. Lord, you said in your word, my ways are so far above your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But Lord, you've given us this wonderful thing called faith. And Lord, at times when we just don't understand when we can't follow you, as the old song says, when we can't trace your hand, we know we can trust your heart because you're looking out for us. No good thing will you withhold from those who walk upright. So, Father, just help us to, to run with what we know right now and trust you for what we don't know, knowing that one day when we stand in heaven with you, we will know all things, even as we are known by you this very moment. So, God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the, the bedrock foundation of it, that we can take it, apply it to our lives, and learn how to be Christ followers and disciples who make disciples in this, in this life. So, Father, as we leave today, I pray that we'll just leave here refreshed, renewed, and ready to just uh, do what the things that you've designed for us to do this week. Father, wherever we go and whatever happens, we know that you are going to be there with us. You're going to uh, overshadow us. You're going to guide our steps. You're even going to guide our, give us our stops sometimes, Lord. And when we, when you, when we uh, have those times, Father, we pray that we'll just look to you. 
and trust you for all that we have because, Lord, your promises are indeed yes and amen. And all the church said, amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.